Hello and welcome to the eighth video in this series looking at an introduction to neural networks. So in this video then I'd like to start explaining a little bit about neural networks and how they work. And again as I've said throughout this series I'm really going to try and break this down and do it um, as simple as possible. I'll repeat what I said I think in the introductory video. This is really aimed at someone coming to this for the first time. If you've done quite a lot of work with these or well, you're an expert, this certainly isn't for you. In fact, the entire series isn't really for you. So what is a neural net then? A neural net is nodes that are connected together. And on the page here, you can see we have three nodes represented by squares. And they're, in this case, what's known as an input layer. So our neural net has some input nodes, and those will have a value. And then after the input, we have more nodes, this time with circles. And these are, when they come out of the input, known as a hidden layer. And we can have more than one hidden layer. Here we've got two hidden layers. And these layers can have as many, a few, or as many nodes in them as you'd like. And in fact, when you're building your network, the choice is up to you. There's quite a lot of literature on how to specify the correct number of nodes to get the network to work the best. But you can have as little or as many as you like. So we have some inputs. In this case, we've got three squares on the screen. So into our net, we get three inputs. We have a hidden layer with three nodes, then another hidden layer with four nodes. And then at the end of your network, you might have more hidden layers. You get an output layer. And that also consists of nodes. And in your network, all of these nodes are interconnected, flowing from the input to the output layer. And the idea of the neural network is for a given input, it will give us a certain output that we desire, which will tell us something. The way these connections through the network work, you can see a little bit, hopefully, on the screen with the colorization here. We can see that the, the blue node in hidden layer one is connected to each of the nodes in the input layer as is the red node in hidden layer one and also the green node. And then I haven't colorized them, but you can see how in hidden layer two, each node is then connected to each of the nodes in hidden layer one. And in the output layer, each node is connected to each of the four nodes in hidden layer two. So this is what a neural network looks like. We have some inputs, we have some hidden layers, they're all interconnected, and we have some outputs. And the question is, is what, why, or what are we trying to do with this? So to give a very, very basic and simple example, and this is more of a schematic than anything, we could imagine that we've got a neural network where we take an image, like you can see the number five here, written by hand, and this comes from this very famous MNIST images database. And maybe we give this image to a neural network and we want the neural network to tell us that this number is the number five. So in this case, image recognition. And how does this work then in terms of our input, our hidden layers and our output layers? Well, let's imagine we split this image into four distinct pieces. What we can say then is that these four pieces, if we take an image as an input, we split it into four, and these four pieces become our inputs to our neural network. And then you would ask, well, what exactly are these inputs? Well, for this example, let's say maybe the average grayscale value of each of these sections of the image is our input into our neural network. Another important thing to note about neural networks is when we start talking about values in the input, the outputs, normally they are normalized from zero to one or from 0 0.01 to 0 0.99 usually. So you don't have some value influencing another value. So what you're seeing here, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.25, 0 0.18 are all normalized average grayscale values of each quarter of the input image. So when we start building our network, our network has four inputs from the input image. It takes an image that you give it, splits it up into four, and assigns, in this case, the average grayscale value. And what happens then is, and again, this is just an example, let's say we want five outputs from our network. And we want in each of the outputs to it to tell us if output, the top box with equals one has the highest value that the network says the image was a one. If this box with equals two has the highest value, then the image was two and so on. So let's imagine we got these as our output values from our network. So we've got all of these input values on the left here, 0.2, 0.3, 0.25, 0 0.18. And then we get 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.25, 0 0.6 and 0.7 as our outputs. We want from our network to assign the number, the images are number one to the first output, number two to the second output, etc. In this case, you can see the highest value 
is 0.7 for the box that we want that says the image is a 5. So in this case, our network is telling us it thinks the image is a 5, or most likely to be a 5. It's also not sure, it actually thinks it might be a 4, but very close, but it says it's more than likely a 5. And that's how a neural network works. We take inputs, which sometimes can be, sometimes can be hundreds and hundreds or thousands of input nodes, and we try to get it to estimate us what that input probably is. And a classic example of that is image recognition. Another one, of course, would be voice recognition. Another one that lots of people try is uh, whether stocks are going to go up or down in the future or anything like that. But it's taking a load of inputs and trying to estimate for us what that input, a certain output from that input. In this case, it's trying to tell us what the image probably is. And the way it gets from this input to the output is via these hidden layers. So if we take a schematic of a network like this with slightly fewer inputs and fewer outputs because it makes it easier for me to draw and have a look at how we get from the input to the output. And what I'm going to do here is just take the top portion of this network here and just follow a path through one of the points right at the top of this network. So from this full network here, I'm just going to take the top section flatten that out and let's have a look how we can travel through the network. Well, the way it works is by using things called weights. So at each connection between nodes, there is a weight. And I've written that here with weight input to hidden one, weight hidden one to hidden two, and weight hidden two to output here. And it's these weights that are used to calculate the values at each stage through the neural network. So let's assign some arbitrary weights to our network. In this case, the first weight here is 0.2, then we've got 0.3, and then we've got 0.15. And now let's assume for our input at this node, we've got a 0.4. What we do is we multiply the 0.4 by the 0.2 weight to get the value at the hidden layer, which would be 0.08. And now we have this value, we'll multiply that by 0.3, and we get the second hidden layer value, 0.0. .0 and I'm sure you've gathered now, we then multiply this by the final weight to get the final output value, which is 0 0.036. However, that's not quite all the story for calculating the path through a neural network. So one of the, the big things that a neural network is good at, or it tries to do, is that it's nonlinear, or it can be nonlinear. And what we hear, we've got here is a calculation that's very, very linear. It's essentially a formula. And a neural network is something, and I'm sure you can read in literature and find lots of pictures online of pigeon brain neurons and things like that. It's trying to mimic our nonlinear thinking. And when we calculate the values through the network, we try to introduce some nonlinearity. And with this nonlinearity, we also try to normalize the values through the network somewhat as well. I've already said we normalize the inputs between 0 0.01 and 0.99. Well, the outputs effectively are probability. And in most cases, you want some kind of output between 0 and 1, depending on the use case. So going back to the first calculation of the network, where we did the 0 0.4 times 0 0.2 to get 0 0.08, we don't actually multiply this by 0 0.3. We actually modify this value. So we'll say that our input value into the hidden layer was 0 0.3. 08. But then we do something called applying an activation function to this value to get our output value. Now there's lots and lots of literature online about all sorts of different kinds of activation functions. And you can see in the top right here that we're using one of the most popular, it's called a sigma, a sigmoid, sorry. And essentially what that does is that takes the value, in this case 0 0.08, applies the formula 1 over 1 plus e to the minus 0 0.8, and that is then our output value. So in terms of normalization and uh, nonlinearity, what exactly is the sigmoid doing? Well, if you look at the graph on the top right here, along the x-axis, we have our inputs. Along the y-axis, we have our outputs. And you can see, so any input less than minus five or more, or any output at five or more, will just give us the output of either very close to zero or very close to one. In fact, you can see it tails off. And they only really vary for values between, let's say, minus two and plus two here. So it has the effect of introducing nonlinearity and also normalizing our result between zero and one. So what actually happens is when we've calculated our value into the hidden layer, we then apply the sigmoid function or the activation function to get our output value. And for this, I'm going to use this uh, sigma symbol here. So in the reality, we get an output value of 0 0.52, not 0 0.08. 
And then we take this value and multiply that by 0 0.3 to get a value into our second hidden layer. And then the same thing's done with the activation function here to get 0 0.54. And then finally with the output layer, we do the 0 0.54 multiplied by 0.15 and we do the same thing at the output layer to get our final value from the path throughout the network. And it's important to remember this activation function step because we get some normalization of the values and we also introduce some non-linearity into the network. So in this example here, what we looked at was one path, the path highlighted in red. And obviously we've got lots of paths between the nodes here, just the first node of hidden layer one has two other values coming into it. So how are these calculated along with just the singular value here? Well, I'll take again a slightly simpler network to show this. And now that we understand um, input layers, hidden layers and output layers, we can see that we'll introduce some weights here and some input values. And just a quick word on the weights as well. When you first start off with your neural net, the weights are randomly generated. And there are lots of different uh, literature and formula and things online about how best to generate the, the weights. We will most likely in the code use a normal distribution to do it. Generally, the weights are either between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5 or 0 and 1 or 0 0.01 and 0 0.99, somewhere in this kind of range. And, and how you generate your weights really can affect the, the performance of uh, your neural network quite dramatically. And the learning process that takes place in the neural network is actually through the adjustment of these weights to continuously learn and get the best output. Anyway, so looking at the neural net that we have here, we've got the three inputs, we've got two nodes in a hidden layer, and we've got weights going to each of the hidden layer from the inputs. So if we look at the first node in the hidden layer, how we calculate that is the 0 0.5 times 0 0.1 plus 0 0.9 times 1.13 plus 0 0.1 times 0 0.65, which gives us 0 0.232. And then the second node will be calculated with 0 0.5 times 0 0.2 plus 0 0.9 times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.1 times 0 0.11 to give us 0.561. And now we use sigma on those to get our output. Now let's assign some random weights between our outputs and the output layer. And the same process takes place now. 0.56 multiplied by 0.2 plus 0.64 multiplied by 0.8 will give us 0.624. We'll get 0.728 for the second one and 0.632 for the third one. And the last thing we do then is again apply sigma to get our output result. So for this neural network here with these weights, for the inputs 0 0.5, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, we get the outputs outputs 0 0.651, 0 0.674 and 0 0.653. So hopefully you've got the idea of how things are calculated now. And the important thing with a neural net now, of course, you can see if we adjust the weight slightly for the same inputs, we'll get different outputs. And that's what we try to do with the learning is adjust the weights such that we get the output that we want. We get the correct output. How we adjust the weights is using a mutation algorithm, which we'll see later on in this series. All this multiplication by hand here is a bit of a pain to do, as you can imagine. And you're probably already thinking, well, how in the world do I write this in code? Particularly as a lot of neural nets uh, won't be as simple looking as this. For this series, it is a simple net. But for the image recognition, for example, which maybe I'll do a series on for MNIST, we have 700 odd inputs into the neural network and hundreds of hidden nodes and things. And writing code to calculate that or do it by hand is, is, is a bit of a pain. But the good news is that, particularly in Python, there's an easier way. If we look at these three input nodes here and H1 and H2 as a hidden layer with two nodes and some weights, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, we can see that the value of hidden node 1 would be 0 0.3 times 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 times 0 0.3 plus 0 0.4 times 0 0.2, which is 0 0.17. And H2 is 0 0.3 times 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2 times 0 0.1 plus 0 0.4 times 0 0.6, which is 0 0.38. And that here is actually a matrix multiplication. If you took a matrix of the weights going into each hidden node, that would be a row. So 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.2 and 0 0.4, 0 0.1 and 0 0.6. And then that's a matrix with two rows and three columns. And then multiply that by the inputs, which is a matrix of three rows and one column. We get then exactly the same output, just with matrix multiplication. Now, if you're like me and hadn't before looking at this, hadn't looked at matrices since school, then uh, you might want to spend half an hour with a pen and paper just multiplying these out, which I did, which is a pain to remember it all. But the two golden rules are written here. The number of columns in the first matrix must equal the number of rows in the second, and the result will have the same number of rows as the first matrix, 
and the same number of columns as the second. And the important thing to note here with the matrix multiplication is you have to shape the weights matrix and the inputs matrix such that you get the correct shape you want with the multiplication for the hidden layer. So in this case, it's the weights matrix multiplied by the input matrix, not the other way around, which wouldn't work. So then we take these values and go through sigmoid, and then we introduce some more weights. And that we need to calculate with hidden layer of 0.542 and 0.94. We need to make a matrix of that and of the weights going to the output layer. And in this case, the output layer is three nodes. So we need a matrix of three rows and one column. And to do that, that means we need to multiply a matrix of three rows and two columns by two rows and one column here. And that multiplication looks like this, and it gives us then the result of our output. And we put this through sigmoid to get our final result, which looks like this. And the important thing to note, and something I always keep on hand for reference, is the shapes of the matrices that we have here through the multiplication process. So how does this look then in code? Well, the next video I'm going to actually show uh, some examples of doing this matrix calculations in code before we carry on with the series. But just to close off this video, a very quick look. NumPy has matrix calculation already built in. The thing to note with NumPy is that matrices are essentially, essentially lists inside lists. So you have a list of numbers. If we take the weights matrix here on the left hand side, the point 1, point 0.3, point 0.2, etc., that will be represented in NumPy. You can see here on the right hand side the matrix of weights between inputs, and that's then a list. And then you can see that each row here, each row here then represents one of the rows inside the original matrix. And the same then with the inputs. What's really important to note also with the inputs, of course, is that each list is a row inside our matrix. And then the values inside that list represent each of the columns. And last here is num np, so numpy dot 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 multiplies the two matrices together, which then gives us the result that we can also calculate by hand. In the next video, I'm going to go through some actual examples of all the kinds of calculations we're going to do inside the code before we go back into carrying on with the, the Flappy app. So last but not least, then how will this be introduced then inside our game. Well, our game's going to have a neural network of two inputs, one hidden layer with five nodes, and then one output. So very, very simple. The input is going to be the distance to uh, the back of the nearest pipe, the top pipe, not the lower one. And it's going to be the distance that we are from the middle of the gap. Remember, the gap is always the same. And these are the only inputs we're going to use. And actually, one of the most difficult things, the most critical things with a neural net is deciding what your inputs are going to be. So for instance, it's very tempting with the bird to say things like maybe its distance from the top and its distance from the bottom are both separate inputs. The problem with this is whilst they both might make sense at first, they're actually not independent. The distance to the top is completely proportional to the distance to the bottom. And there are many other examples of this that you could do in this game as well. For instance, the gap we know between the tubes is consistent, yet you might want to have the distance to the top of the bottom tube and the distance to the bottom of the top tube as well but they're both effectively the same thing. So when you're choosing your inputs to your neural network, you need to choose one, inputs that really do have an effect on the output, and two, inputs that are independent of each other. Otherwise, you will what you'll find, and you'll see very quickly, is the network won't work properly, and it certainly won't learn very well. And then last but not least, we have an output, and I've put above here, greater than or equal to 0 0.5, we flap. Um, I might change that and make that greater than or equal to 0.3 or something like this, just so that they don't all race to the top of the screen at the start of the process. So what we're going to do now then is in the next video, we're going to have a look at NumPy and just go over the bits of code that we'll use to set up our neural network. And then the following video, we'll set ourselves up a class that builds us a neural net that we're allowed to query, that makes calculations with the matrices that for the inputs we give it, gives us then the output that we want. So that's it then for this video. I hope it's a little bit long, but I hope the explanation was clear enough of what we're trying to do with our neural net, what we're trying to doing in terms of going from an input to an output. Um, any problems or questions, then please feel free to comment. Otherwise, thanks very much for watching and see you in the next one.